What is the relationship, if any, between the figure of Jesus Christ, Christmas, Christianity as a whole, and Krishna? Can you practice bhakti yoga and at the same time have devotion to Jesus? These are the questions for today. Hi, my name is Cyril War or Chandra. My name is Param Shreya Das or Philip Trier Rabe. And we'd like to welcome you to episode number three of the Bhakti Today podcast. Hi. So Param Shreya, um, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of the audience who's watching and Merry Christmas to you. And Thank my you. question, my first question to you, you're welcome, is what, coming from a, from a Christian Protestant background, what's your take mm -hmm. on Jesus Christ? Yeah, um, my parents were not that religious. However, I came in touch with Christianity a lot. And uh, every Christmas Eve we went to the church. So, and I went to a youth church group once a week and learned mm. about the Bible, learned about Lord Jesus. And of course, I found him quite impressive. So in Germany, they say Lord Jesus, huh? Uh, in German, they say Jesus Christus. Just Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, I always had a very appreciative uh, attitude towards Lord Jesus. And uh, when I was 13, I studied a Bible version for the first time. And yeah, the, the devotion, that faith that there is a God and that God is good and Lord Jesus represents this good God, that always... Um, that I resonated think, with you, huh? Of course, yes. Yeah. Hmm. How about you? It sort of resonates more now. It's not that I was an atheist or anything. I grew up in a Catholic, very loose, but Catholic nonetheless, family mm -hmm. from either my father's side or he had grown up with the Jesuits in, in Egypt. Um, but was not very religious at all. My mother was more religious for perhaps sentimental reasons. Her mother was very devoutly uh, Catholic from the Catholic Croatian sphere of Christianity. Um, as a matter of fact, my grandmother insisted that I get my first communion, so I did have my first communion. You know when you have a, a laughter fit and you can't control your laughter? Mm -hmm. That's what happened when I was in the line to get my, my first communion. Somehow two or three students, we just started laughing like crazy and we couldn't stop laughing as we were approaching this, you know, supposed to be very solemn kind of moment. <laughs> um, but now in retrospect, just like yesterday, I was speaking to one gentleman at the train station here in Montpellier and uh, you know, very prim and proper young guy, maybe in his mid twenties, you could see he was married. He had a, he had a ring on super clean, well, you know, clean cut and, and very eloquent and thoughtful. We had a discussion and, you know, he was, he was a, a Catholic. He is a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And like you said, I, I told him it's nice to meet people who actually are faithful, who believe in a, in a personal God. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So you came from France and Croatia. That is quite Catholic. That's my Catholic background, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> in Germany, it is half-half. The northern mm. part is more Protestant and the southern part is more Catholic. And there Catholic. Were, were a lot of fights going on in the last yeah, centuries. Sure. But now I think uh, they have cooled down, fortunately. Mm. Yeah, so um, my, my opinion is, uh, my observation is that when I think back, let's say 30 years ago, when I took interest in Bhakti Yoga, and I had some discussions with Christians that at that time more Christians were very more, you know, intolerant towards other religious or spiritual ideas. Mm -hmm. And, and nowadays, nowadays, when I um, talk to many Christian priests, as you have said, um, then my observation is that there is more way more tolerance and more you know a broad mindedness right also i read some book 
Mm-hmm. That a sociology of religion book, I forget the name, a very scholarly, big, thick one. And the statistics show that in the Christian world, the, there's a large percentage, majority percentage of Christians who believe that people from other faiths may and do attain salvation, you know, go to heaven when they die, as opposed to, to in the past. And I think this is sort of being forced upon, upon all of us because there's such a sort of a, right, there's such a, a mixture of, of cultures and, and everything is so public and visible through the internet and there's so much multiculturalism that um, it's, it's kind of hard to maintain a, an exclusivist, we are the only ones going to heaven kind of attitude, right? Yes, right. Yeah. So that is also your observation in day, daily life? Yeah, I've had my share of meeting some what I would call pretty fanatic Christians. You know, in my years when I was a, a monk and I was distributing Bhagavad Gita's in the Los Angeles airport, <laughs> among other places, occasionally, you know, you'd find a, a gentleman or a gentle lady who was a little bit, a little bit sectarian in, in their views and, mm-hmm. you know, just... But I think that exists uh, in every tradition, including including our tradition, doesn't it? <laughs> right, right. So what is, what is, in your opinion, the core message of Christianity or, or the message of Lord Jesus, in your opinion? I'm not a Christian scholar, but I do believe that, uh, that devotion to a personal God is really at the, at the root, is the common denominator devotion, a relationship of love and devotion between an individual soul and a personal, also individual supreme God. Don't you think, don't you think that would be a, the, the, the condensed crux, the condensed noyau, yes. central theme? Yes, I also think like that. And it is interesting, you, you find this in practically all great religions the theistic ones at least the theistic like Islam Judaism Christianity and even in Hinduism we can talk about this maybe later that in our um, tradi- the tradition that we follow yes the monotheistic um, tradition of Hinduism we call right. it call it uh, Vaishnavism Bhakti devotion to Lord Vishnu or Krishna Rama the various avatars of Lord Vishnu and Krishna. So, but um, yeah, you you find this in every of these great religions that there is this, I would say, this core that people understand that the the essence of of one's religion is to, to, um, to develop that relationship to the personal God and to to exchange a loving, strong, loving relationship. So, um, and I, I can see this also in Christianity. We have this, we have this in every religion that people who, who more focus on rituals, on rules, on, on these external stuff, how, how you dress, for instance, or how you make, make a certain ritual or how to pray and and then there are other people who really understand the essence that you can pray in this way you can pray in that way or in that way and the essence is that you have this sincere um, relationship or approach towards God what do you and from God towards you exactly yeah what do you think yeah, I think that's the, the core, the core, the cord, let's say, the core cord, <laughs> or the, the f- foundational cord that's, that, that was strung, so to speak, or hit or touched uh, when I became a devotee of Krishna. Mm-hmm. This idea that, because, because before I became a devotee of Krishna, I, I looked into Buddhism a little bit, mm-hmm. and I loved the idea of reincarnation and karma, but something was missing. And as I told you at the beginning, I think in retrospect with age, with decades and age, you realize, okay, this is what I was lacking, for example, when I started dallying with, with Buddhism. And it's, again, this idea of a personal relationship with a personal God. But what's cool about the Bhagavad Gita is that you have this personalism 
you know, a personal God, we are personal, we are individuals, we have a personal individual relationship with God, but at the same time there's these two concepts that are in the mix and that you don't find, and we can talk about this next perhaps, which is you just don't find mm -hmm. in Christianity, um, and that is the notion of karma and reincarnation. And so for me that was like, a, oh my God, so cool. You can keep a, the idea of a personal God with all the cool implications of that, meaning, you know, that relationships can be real, emotions are real if they're pure, as opposed to, you know, nothing is real and we're non-existent <laughs> or we're just some white blob. Mm -hmm. And on top of this personalist, personal uh, conception of God, the notions of karma and multi-lives, which I find uh, extremely attractive, theologically speaking. Right, right. We were talking about reincarnation, right? We're going to talk about that today. Yeah, because that's interesting. It's exactly what I also thought, that um, you see in Christianity you have this devotion, this sentiment, but it's somehow lacking in, in, in certain areas the, the, uh, a deep, thorough, I, I would call it scientific, philosophical understanding. Hmm. I, I personally missed a lot. And um, the founder Acharya of ISKCON, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, he made in his Bhagavad Gita as it is, he, he made a very interesting point. He said that um, philosophy without religion is more like speculation. You can speculate your philosophy, the other one is speculating his philosophy, and there is no, no solid ground. And, but also, uh, philosophy without religion, no, vice versa, sorry. Religion without philosophy. Religion without philosophy is, can lead to, not only to sentimentalism, but even to fanaticism, that one right. becomes totally, um, yeah, how, how should I put it, uh, you, you only think about your rules and rituals and cannot see the, the, the forest. Um, what is the saying? You just see the trees. You cannot see the trees due to the forest. So, of, If I may though, if you say this to a Christian today or you know, that you guys have no theology, <laughs> you guys are just sentimental, they may take it the wrong way. Um, I would say, look, we, I think you know, the, the, the Gaudiya Vaishnav theology is just more sophisticated. Yeah, um, of course there is theology, but I would say, for instance, I give you an example what was troublesome for me. Um, in, within Christianity, it is difficult to explain why bad things happened to good people. Oh, the question, the question of evil. Yeah, the question of evil without karma and reincarnation is kind of a, of a tricky one, isn't it? Yeah, and that's, that's, what I, that's what I thought of, that here some very important philosophical or even scientific understanding is lacking within Christianity. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't even say that uh, Lord Jesus himself, I, I can very much imagine that Lord Jesus was quite happy or cool with reincarnation and these other great um, yeah, spiritual personalities we can find in Christianity. But um, in, in due course of time, let's say within the, in the, the last 2000 years, that, that thought of reincarnation and karma somehow got lost. Yeah, some people say that Origen, one of the founding fathers of the church, I can tell you briefly, I wrote a paper at Oxford University on him, um, mm -hmm. and I had to have it, they told me to have to rewrite it, otherwise I would fail. <laughs> so I, took, I kind of took it easy, and I wrote this paper without really doing enough due diligence, and I sort of repeated kind of blindly what you find on the... I mean, I did some research, but there's this common idea among sort of pop culture that, you know, early Christians believe in reincarnation, and the proof is the teachings of origin. Mm. 
Um, and I remember I was standing in front of uh, the guys who are the graders for your oral exam for my master's at Oxford, and one of them just, you know, after having read that paper, in which I basically made the claim that Origen believed in reincarnation, he said there's no proof at all, and if you don't, re if you, don't you know, basically we're failing you. <laughs> And I, I was shocked. I, had to, I begged them, please, okay, let me rewrite this thing. So they gave me two extra months to rewrite it, and I spent like the whole summer in Bibliothèque Saint-Geneviève in Paris actually doing the research I should have been do doing for several <laughs> for months at Oxford. Um, and, and when you look at all the teachings of origin, even there, now if some things were lost, you know, if some things were suppressed, that may be, but as a as a scholar, as an amateur scholar, you know, the, the rule is you deal, you, 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 you deal with what's available visibly in terms of manuscripts. You know? And so whatever manuscript have survived, even Origen didn't really believe in the type of reincarnation that you and I would believe in or that the viewer would believe in. Namely this idea that you know, the body is an envelope and the real person is the soul and the soul was in a previous envelope in a previous life. And if, you know, the soul doesn't get liberated and goes back to heaven, we'll continue incarnating into different bodies. Um, mm -hmm. That type of definition of reincarnation is just not there, not even in Origen, unfortunately. Origen, you know, very, being in, very, very influenced by Plato, um, talked about the pre-existence of the soul, which means kind of like 50% of what we believe, or not even. It's the idea that the soul may have existed before it was in this body. Right? But it doesn't imply that it had different bodies before. It just said that it existed. Where and how, we don't know. And it certainly doesn't imply that the soul will continue to incarnate after the death of this body. So that was kind of like my sad... And then they gave me a good grade on that. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, Christianity, I would say... I would say, yeah, unfortunately, and I do, I say it boldly, unfortunately, Christians generally don't believe in reincarnation. I think that's somewhat of a problem. Now, the good thing is you can still have tremendous devotion to God. And I think it's Christmas we should be positive and, you know, look at the, the, the positive, which certainly exists. Um, it's just like, and I'll leave you because, I, I mean, I'll, I don't want to take the, the microphone too long, but you know how there's this analogy of, or the, the example of if you have a little, if you have a pavement on the street, a paved sidewalk, there's some cracks, right? And little, little plants manage to grow through these little cracks. Mm -hmm. So similarly, and I don't want to sound arrogant, but I do believe that the Bhagavad Gita offers a superior type of theology. I'm making a judgment, I'm sorry. So assuming that premise, it's amazing though that in spite of having, let's say, perhaps a not as great or not as sophisticated theology, still the expressions of devotion, which you can compare to these little you know, creepers, still manage to, to show their face in such humbling ways. And, 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 I mean, I'm sure you, uh, certainly I have read and seen examples of, of Christian, Christian expressions of devotion to God that make me feel pretty embarrassed about my own practices mm. about the yogi. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I, I agree. Yes, I also have seen lots of very devoted Christians going to pilgrimage, for instance, or taking up certain types of austerities. Oh, man. Have you ever been to Lavra in Ukraine, in Kiev? There's this beautiful Orthodox church, like a big mm -hmm. compound. And there's like these underground, they were caves. And you see the, the skeleton remains of these saints who lived like 30, 40 years underground wow. in total pitch darkness, praying all day. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yes, and... When, when I came in touch with Krishna consciousness or Bhakti Yoga, I first I wonder, do I change now my religion? Am I converting now from one religion to another? And I was so happy when I read many things that the founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness presented. Um, that, he's, that he was totally fine with, with Jesus Christ and with his teachings. And I just, uh, yesterday I stumbled over a, a, a letter he wrote to, to an aspiring disciple. And hmm, so read it to us. If you like, uh, it's just a few sentences, but very, very touching. And that, for me, that I thought, 
well, this is really universal. I'm not changing from one religion to another, but just my, my vision becomes more broad, broader. Mm. Yeah? So he's writing to a devotee called Suchandra. I, I guess, I'm assuming that this is the today's Bhakti Bhushana Swami. Anyway, it's in it's 8th December of 1969, and Srila Prabhupada writes, I am very glad that you are feeling very strongly for Lord Jesus Christ. You have already mentioned the exemplary character of Lord Jesus Christ, that he sacrificed everything for God. This example should be taken. So here Srila Prabhupada said we can follow his example. Prabhupada the, used the example of Jesus a lot, isn't it? When he's talking about how a, a devotee of God uh, takes, takes, takes risks and sacrifices personal comfort for the sake of raising the consciousness of humanity. Right? He uses, you know, he says, the, in the, I think in the Bhagavad Gita somewhere he says, the favorite example is Jesus Christ, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, the process should be, should be to follow the example, not to imitate the exact activities. So we should not become so far that we, each of us will be nailed on the cross. For example, Lord Jesus Ouch. Christ wanted to preach amongst um, some person who were practically against the principle of accepting God as the Supreme. Mm. And the result was that these people crucified him. At the present moment, the world situation is more dangerous than before. People have become actually godless. So if you follow the footsteps of Lord Jesus Christ to preach God consciousness against godlessness and dedicate your life in that way, that will be the real purpose of following Jesus Christ. Hmm. You remind me, when I started reading Prabhupada's books and reading his views on Jesus, I had sort of an awakening. Oh, okay, this is what Jesus, this is who he was. This is what he was about. Did that happen to you also? Sort of a clearer clear appreciation of, of the figure of Christ. Right, right. And also... Now what about the meat-eating? Oops. Okay, um, one second. Uh, just um, because um, Srila Prabhupada, he talked about that we, we should follow the example of Lord Jesus. And that is also a very interesting point that many Christians, they, they say that Jesus is the Father, and Father is Jesus. I always, I don't know what about you, but I always got a little confused about how can the Son be the Father and the, the Father be the Son. But then Srila Prabhupada, he explained also in this letter that it is not, it is not exactly the person that, in, in one sense, that the Son becomes the Father and vice versa, but the message, both the father and the son had the same message. Mm. And in this way, they were one. And also we can become in one way one with Lord Jesus and with the father by, by following. By spreading God consciousness. Exactly. And, and this is, I think, a typical, what you're explaining, I think is a typical devotee, Krishna conscious, bhakti yogi take on Jesus, namely seeing him really more as the liberated soul, the very advanced soul, you know, who's got some pl special blessings from the Lord, who's on a special mission from God, who, who was perhaps sent directly by God, right? Um, and some schools of Christianity, from my limited understanding, more towards the Orthodox schools, you know, accept that. But then in, your, in, in, you know, in Protestant Christianity and other smaller sects, like, for example, Mormonism, the, the stress is more on the other that you know God, Jesus really is the supreme Father. He really is God, and that's where devotees, I think, of Krishna in in, in the large majority, I think I would probably bet all of them would say, eh, we have a problem with that. Like I don't, I don't think Jesus was God. Like we don't see Prabhupada as God. We don't see you know God in that sense, godly with the same intention, with the same mission, with the same. Mm, 
you know, family business, so to speak, but not in terms of ontological identity, as you say. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. We wanted to, uh, to share with our viewers a little, a little video clip of a few, a few, a few moments. Yeah, this is a little clip that you'll see here now is, is a conversation between Prabhupada and Cardinal Dianelu. And as we were talking yesterday, you seem to stress uh, the point that Prabhupada seemed to stress a lot that Christians, unfortunately, kill animals and eat them. And that, was seem, that seems to be like that was his main sort of concern, wasn't it, against the Christian world? Exactly. Whenever Srila Prabhupada talked with some pastor or priest or cardinal or bishop, this was the first point he was addressing. Thou okay, shall so, not kill. Oh. And he, is, he, he, he also directed it especially towards the killing of animals. Food. We, for the food of man, to eat, to eat, man, man can eat grains, food grains, fruit, milk, sugar, we not not uh, for the share, for the, not uh, no flesh, no flesh. No. We are here. another thing is that how can you suppose that animal killing is not seen? Yes. Comment comment uh, justifier que tuer les animaux n'est pas péché? Yes, because we we thought uh, that uh, there is a difference of nature between uh, life of man, uh, la life of spirit, and uh, biological biological life. Don't kill cows. Mm. That is the greatest sin. Yes. And so long one will be sinful, he will not be able to understand yes. what is God. Yes. But human being, main business is to understand God yes. and to love Him. Yes. But if he remains sinful, mm. neither he can understand God yes. and what to what is the question of loving? Yes. Yeah, that's a very interesting excerpt, this uh, talk between Srila Prabhupada and Cardinal Danilo. I, I love his accent. I especially love his accent. His accent is, is wonderful. The life of man, after all, it is the life of animal. <laughs> no, doubt, no doubt now that you originally have some French roots. <laughs> uh, of course. <laughs> I stumbled upon this book here. It's a German writer, author, Andreas English, and he was a very close uh, journalist. He was very close to the late Pope John Paul II. He was with him every day for, let's say, 20 years or so. And, wow. and he wrote about an episode that happened that people wrote Pope John Paul letters people who are owners of cats and dogs. Mm, what Do our cats and dogs go to heaven? Exactly. That was the question again and again and again. And I think it was one of the main German newspapers, the Bild Zeitung, the, most, uh, the biggest newspaper. I think uh, they brought a report and, and um, exclaim to the people that now the Pope finally has given his conf confirmation or confirmant confirmation yeah confirmation confirmation that dogs and cats are also go going to heaven, go to heaven. <laughs> and all these hallelujah yeah they they were they were in enjoy all these and I don't know if you know Germany, but I think there are millions, millions of people who have a cat or have a dog, and they were so they were all happy. They were all ha happy, and and my mm. and as cute as it is in one sense, but my next thought was, but why only cats and dogs? <laughs> 
what right. about the what about the the cows and the and what the about pigs? yeah right and the the, the chickens. chickens so what 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 do the the dogs and the cats have that uh, pigs and cows don't have so yeah yeah so hopefully the 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 current pope francis will uh, expand or yeah ex i think he has i think if i'm not mistaken a few years ago he made some declaration about animals also again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not to take credit but actually we will take credit because but i believe there's a connection mm -hmm. but it is a fact that the current pope grew up and had friends who were Hare krishnas mm -hmm. and i think there is no doubt that <laughs> more and more Christian people become more and more sensitive and aware about the right. animal treatment. I even but unfortunately, if I may, unfortunately, when it comes to justifying Christian vegetarianism from the point of view of the Bible, it's a tough effort. It's, really, it's a tough job. It's really a, 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 hill, a climbing uphill. Um, for your information, another paper I wrote I mean, it's not for your information, it's just to, to, as a service to this conversation, a nice element to bring in, I think, is the work of the Reverend Andrew Lindsay, who was a professor at Oxford, who was my advisor there for Christian studies. And I, I did my paper on his work. He's like a world famous author who wrote like 20 books on Christian vegetarianism. He's a Christian vegetarian and he believes, you know, based on several arguments, mostly from the Old Testament, that Christians should all be vegetarians. And you know what, Paramashreya, you know, the conclusion of my research, as much as I, you know, I had affection for him, although we had a falling out afterwards, um, is that it's really, it's like, my conclusion was, you know what, if you really want to talk about a, Christian, a vegetarianism from a, from a scriptural theistic perspective, just, just do it from the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> as arrogant and condescending as it may sound, um, it's it's tough to um, because there's so many arguments you know found in the New Testament mm -hmm. and stuff pro animal killing you know what I mean that's true I uh, although that I found some piece here that is also a very interesting book there is one scholar Bible scholar V A Holmes Gore and he detected that um, eight eleven twelve 18, 19 words in the, in the uh, New Testament that were just in, in the old language, Greek, were, were translated as um, food or eating or um, foodstuff. All these 19 words were translated purposefully into meat. So when you, wow, interesting. When you read the New Testament, you... In, in 19 cases, you, you stumble uh, on spots where you think, oh, here is it, here it is, meat, 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 19 times. But this scholar, he has examined the, the original Greek text and there were just, um, uh, 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 it was just, uh, uh, the original translation was just foodstuff and, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. So... Interesting. There, there is a. I think when you really dig dig into it, there is there was this 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 uh, emperor Constantine Constantine, and he he made Christianity the the main religion of of the Roman Empire, and he 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 made it that condition that we this eat meeting has to be allowed in Christianity, otherwise. I'm not supporting it. Mm. So these these first Christians they they made a lot of compromise re regarding meat eating and treating of animals. I think we should keep that on the radar. Hmm. Interesting. One thing I wanted to talk about is the history of of Christian preachers and how it relates to the Hare Krishna movement. Because you and I are members of the Hare Krishna movement, you and I have dedicated a lot of our time and effort to try to you know, share Krishna consciousness, right, with others. A lot of viewers are also in that uh, in that space. And if you don't mind, I wanted to talk to you guys and to you about 
two people really briefly. One is a uh, late, 18, uh, late 19th century or 18th century uh, Bengali Brahmin turned Catholic. And the other is Billy Graham, probably one of the greatest uh, 20th century preachers in North America. May I? Just to make a point about... Because for those of you who, who are maybe new to this podcast, uh, one of the discussions that goes on in the Hare Krishna movement is this issue of adapting versus keeping the tradition. Where do you draw the line between you know, losing your identity into the mainstream society, being completely assimilated and losing your identity, your brand? And the other extreme is you know, not adjusting at all in any way and losing relevance completely and becoming a sort of a dinosaur yeah, that's going to be extinguished. So, um, this first person I wanted to briefly talk to you about, really briefly, his name, you can look him up. His name is Brahma Bandab Upadhyay. And I learned about him when I took a course on the history of Catholic preaching at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And what striked me about this figure is that he was a Bengali Hindu who converted to Catholicism and then who became really enthusiastic to spread. Uh, you know, the church's doctrine. And he devised a plan to make an army of sannyasis or Hindu, quote unquote, monks, like dressed in saffron robes, shaved heads, you know, the, the mendicant stick in, in, in his hand, and who would travel all across Bengal preaching the Bible, preaching the Bible. And so he was really, he, his, you know, you know how like an Ayurvedic, terms you put your your hand on your fingers on the pulse and you can really tell the pulse of the of the you know of the of the patient so similarly i think he had a real finger on the pulse of his local culture and so he adjusted in such a way that would facilitate the spreading of the the biblical message in the most of uh, you know efficient way and what happened you know what happened yes you do <laughs> You're just saying no for the audience. <laughs> what happened, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Vatican excommunicated him. They excommunicated him because they thought he was, you know, being heretical. So, um, you know, you can draw your own conclusions. I draw mine. Um, and I think, which are that there's a tendency for the sort of the frontline preacher to precisely to know the pulse of the local culture and do the necessary adjustments that are required. And often, not always, but often, you know, the sort of the, the heavy tank-like management or, you know, bureaucratic structure, which is necessary, is perhaps sometimes a little bit late and sometimes may not see what's, what's, what's happening and may not see that the preacher is actually you know, totally in line with the spirit of the law, so to speak, and, and is actually more loyal than anything. The zeitgeist. Yes, with the zeitgeist. Okay, okay. One of the rare German words that found its way into English dictionaries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty tragic, what you, this biography. Let me tell you about Billy Graham briefly. Mm -hmm. He was a huge preacher in the 1950s and 60s. I, I mean, huge I watched some, in North America. I watched some YouTube videos of him. Mm. The, the whole stadium was packed. Packed, right. He really inspired a lot of people to take up Christianity in the Protestant, you know, evangelical Baptist tradition. And, and when he was a young preacher, he had a team of friends. You know, they were newly married. They were going around the country and even in Europe and preaching. And they had this motto, which I really like. They, they said that we are anchored to the rock and geared to the times. Anchored to the rock, geared to the times. The rock being the message of the Bible. The rock being the message of the Bhagavad Gita in our case, or the Srimad Bhagavatam, the teachings of our founder, and so on. The, the strict, you know, adherence, the sincere adherence to the moral rules that we try to, or the moral, yeah, the, the, the moral codes that we try to live by and, and so on, right? Our, our practice of chanting. So that's like being anchored to the rock and yet geared to the times, geared to the times. And so, in, in, you know, in the 50s, 
they would like apparently they they would dress up you know in suits this was like 1950s so everyone was in a suit and tie right but they had like these fluorescent pink uh, ties and like so they dress in a very sort of non-conventional way still following the local norms you know but really pushing the limit of that norm you know geared to the times and and i think we see that reflected a lot in in current day you know churches around the country or around europe or across america where the pastor you know is very very loyal to the bible even very conservative and yet is you know geared to the times is dressed in jeans and a t-shirt or has a tattoo of jesus and is totally uh, uh, in in uh, in harmony or is totally up on modern technology and social media and so on and i think these are really good examples for members of the Hare Krishna movement especially those of you who are married and who are who are uh, who therefore have by definition the freedom to to really be part of society as opposed to perhaps being, you know, slightly monastic and therefore being a little bit aloof by necessity and by definition from society, although even that's totally flexible for monks, um, to, to really, um, to really uh, how do you say, to, to um, follow the example of, to really look at and, 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 and I would say do the same thing with Krishna consciousness in terms of being anchored to the rock and yet geared to the times. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Yes, uh, that reminds me of the sixth chapter of the Nectar of Devotion. There is a mm -hmm. list of what is very essential in the practice of spiritual life. And also de it, there are details we can change. And I, right. and I think that a successful preacher, he has to differentiate between what is very, very essential that when that is missing, you can f practically forget the whole thing. And on the other side, understand what are details that can be changed according to time, place and circumstances. Like I, I assume that Lord Jesus, he had n not any issue with how his uh, preachers were dressed. His, his concern was that the message will come ac be spread. will be spread, will come across. And if that means that uh, you, you, you wear a certain type of dress that fits within your culture and that helps the spreading of the divine sacred message, then uh, who will have... By all means, right? By all means. Who will have any... Um, any objections right yeah, yeah. right mm -hmm. well it's nice I'm, I mean I it's not Christmas is nice people are nice and like you said uh, when we were just talking before recording like we, we should be thankful that Christianity is there I think our modern civilization would be way worse yes if if you know if Christianity was not present I mean it would be way 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 worse you know yes yes Christian values, even if you're an atheist, you know, you still operate within a very sort of Judeo-Christian mindset. And they're great values, and, 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 and people should, you know, be grateful for them, I think. I also think you can feel it during the Christmas time. I just had a conversation yesterday with a friend. He said, well, this Christmas, it is only about consuming, you know, it's just about consuming. And I, or like buying Christmas gifts and opening exactly. Christmas gifts and yeah and I, I, I told him sure it, it has a lot to do with consuming but still um, and we find this in in our book distribution mission for those who are not familiar with the Hare Krishna movement our one of our main purposes is to spread bhakti literature um, literature dedicated to the relationship between the soul and and God and we are distributing books like Bhagavad Gita for example exactly and and the most successful time uh, when we can approach people and and inspire them to take a book about the eternal relationship between God and the soul is a few weeks before Christmas we have tried this for, I think now, 
more than 40 years, maybe, f maybe f 50 years, yeah, 50 years practically. And there you can, you can scientifically and statistically see that people are way more receptive during the Christmas time. So that is a mm. proof that, as you said, we, we should be happy that there is still Christmas. There are a lot of people beside all this gift uh, shopping at Amazon and, and uh, so on. But still there are lots of people. It has some meaning, some spiritual meaning for them. Mm. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Prabhu's and Mataji's. <laughs> It's an inside joke of ISKCON. Um, we'd like to thank you for having watched this episode number three of uh, Bhakti Today. And uh, I hope that uh, whatever Param Shreya and, and, and I may have discussed um, may have um, you know, broadened your perspective, given you a different angle of vision on, on, on Jesus, on Christianity, especially today on Christmas, on Christmas Day. And I thank you, Param Shreya for this uh, nice episode. Thank you very much. And uh, we, I wish you again and all the audience Merry Christmas. Hmm. See, ya. See ya next time. Hare Krishna.